is generally a, a geometric object that can be defined as the convex hull of a finite number of points in Euclidean space. So the way that we can think about this uh, a little informally is say you have a bunch of uh, points in space. If you take saran wrap and tightly wrap the saran wrap around that set of points, um, that object and all of the points that are contained inside of the saran wrap is what are going to define our polytope. This is one means in which we can define it. There's another, uh, but we won't need that. And further, um, if all of the vertices of the polytope happen to be integral, um, we're going to call that uh, polytope a lattice polytope. So here we can think of this as being instead the convex hull of a finite number of points in the integer lattice contained inside of um, contained inside of that Euclidean space. Okay. So let's see an example of this. Uh, start off easy with uh, an example in R2. Um, here, this is a triangle, right, in R2, and we're taking all the points inside of it. This is defining a two-dimensional lattice polytope. And one means by which we could describe it, of course, would be the convex hull of all of these red dots here. Um, so we have them listed out, essentially, convex hull, just saying we're taking the smallest convex set that contains all of those points. But of course, we see that some of these points we really don't need to include, for example, the origin or any of the points that are on these um, you know, boundary edges. So instead, we could just define this as the convex hull of their extreme points, which we refer to as the vertices. And in this case, the vertices are you know, these two standard basis vectors and the point negative two, negative three. Okay, so this is an example of their lattice polytope. And furthermore, this is, um, this is called a simplex, um, in this case, a two simplex, because we're in two dimensions. Um, what is a simplex? It's just a d-dimensional polytope that has exactly d plus one vertices. So in two dimensions, we're talking about triangles, three dimensions, we're talking about tetrahedra, etc. Okay, so there's going to be two different properties of polytopes that are going to be of interest to us um, for this project. Uh, the first of which is what it means for a lattice polytope to be reflexive. So we say that a lattice polytope is reflexive is if possibly after translation by some integer vector, the origin is going to be contained in the strict interior, uh, the relative interior of uh, the polytope. And furthermore, its geometric dual um, is going to be a lattice polytope, where here we define the geometric dual just to be the set of all points in Euclidean space, such that if you take their inner product with any point in the polytope, it's gonna be less than or equal to one. Okay, so this is what it means for a lattice polytope to be reflexive. And furthermore, a lattice polytope is said to satisfy the integer decomposition property or um, we'll just abbreviate that and say that the polytope is IDP. If for every positive integer T and for any point in the, any integral point in the teeth dilate of the polytope. So here by teeth dilate, we mean you take your polytope, any point inside of it, multiply all of those points by T, that's going to define a new polytope um, that's called the teeth dilate. So now we're saying that for any integral point in the teeth dilate, there's going to exist some set of exactly t integral points in the original polytope, such that if you take their sum, that will be you know, the arbitrary point that you grabbed in the teeth dilate. Okay. So um, understanding or proving this property in general is actually quite uh, challenging, but part of why we're looking specifically at the class of simplices that I'm about to introduce um, in a few moments is because we have a nice characterization of when they'll satisfy the IDP property. So um, yeah, for the sake of this talk, we're gonna be interested in the case in which we're satisfying simultaneously the IDP and reflexivity. And now the last little bit of background information we need uh, before I introduce our object of interest is the notion of what it means to triangulate a point configuration. So a point configuration, we could think as taking just the set of vertices of the polytope and triangulating that. Or more generally, we could say that you take the polytope's vertices and all of its interior lattice points, like any lattice point that's contained on the inside. Um, but in general, point configuration could be any set of points, right? Convex, all of that, um, of course, would define a polytope. So what does it mean to triangulate that point configuration? Well, we're just gonna try to break it up into a bunch of triangles, uh, you know, or a bunch of simplices, more generally. And, we're going to do that in such a way that if you union up all of the different simplices, that's going to be equal to the, um, you know, to the convex hull of the original point configuration. And furthermore, um, if you intersect any of the two simplices that could possibly be empty, the empty face, but otherwise it will still be a face of the polytope. They'll intersect in a common face. 
And we have these two different um, extra notions that uh, will add on to um, triangulations. So a triangulation is said to be unimodular if every simplex has normalized volume one. And here by normalized volume, I mean, you take the Euclidean volume and multiply by the dimension of the polytope factorial. Okay, so if everything has normalized volume one, the triangulation is said to be unimodular. And furthermore, a triangulation point configuration is said to be regular if it can be obtained by um, projecting the lower envelope of a lifting. So in other words, you take the points in your configuration, you lift them into the next higher dimension at, of certain heights, project that back down into the original um, ambient space that you're operating in, and that's going to define um, a regular triangulation, okay? Now, if it can be obtained that way, then it's regular. So um, let's go ahead and triangulate the example that we had started with earlier. So, um, you know, of course, because this was a triangle, if we were only triangulating um, in terms of the vertices, we would be done. Uh, but let's not have it be trivial, right? Let's say that we're taking all of uh, the lattice points that were contained in it. And the method that we're going to use here in order to triangulate it is uh, commonly referred to as the lexicographic or pulling triangulation method. Okay, so we'll start by taking just this point configuration, the set of all the um, lattice points of that polytope, and we want to try to triangulate it. So we start by putting an order on the lattice points. So here I just put, you know, this order on the points, one through seven, and then we're going to successively add points and do this coning over operation to, um, for the visible faces of what's been built up so far. Okay, so to begin, right, we would start with the first point. We add in just that point, there's nothing else. Uh, so we don't need to worry about this cone over thing. We can move straight to the second point. From the second point, the first point is visible. So in order to take care of this coning over, effectively, we're just going to draw an edge between one and two. Okay, so now when we move on to point three, we can see that um, both the vertices one and two and also this edge that go between them are visible. So when we do this coning over operation, we're going to obtain this triangle here. Move on to four. Um, we can see that uh, two, three, and the edge between them are all visible. So when we cone over, of course, we'll introduce a triangle here. But notice that one is not going to be visible from four because it's collinear with, um, with one and two. Okay, so whenever we do the cone over operation here, we're just going to yield that triangle. And then we'll continue in a similar fashion. When we move to five, do the cone over operation, the three, four was visible. When we move to six, the three, five is visible. When we move to seven, four, five, and six are all visible. So we obtained this triangulation. Okay, at this point, as we've added in everything, done all the cone overs, we're done. And furthermore, I'll claim that this triangulation is both regular and unimodular. So to see unimodularity, um, if you look at the width and height of each of these triangles, all of them are one. So their Euclidean volume is going to be one half. And then because the dimension of um, the space, the you know, affine space that's spanned by these points is two, we'd multiply by two factorial and get one in each case. So the normalized volume of each of these triangles is one, hence we have unimodularity. And regularity actually comes for free because this was a lexicographic triangulation. So lexicographic triangulations always yield uh, regular triangulations. Okay, so now we can finally introduce what it means to have a weighted projective space. So here's the definition. Um, we start with an integer partition. So uh, let's say that this integer partition is Q consisting of the points Q1 through QD. And um, all of these are going to be positive uh, integers and we'll utilize the convention that they, um, they weakly increase. Okay, so this is going to give us a unique representation for any partition. And then we define this lattice simplex associated with that partition where we're just taking the convex hull of the D standard basis vectors and the negative of what this Q vector is. Okay, so this set of simplices that satisfy this form are referred to as weighted projective space simplices. And the name comes from relationship that they have to algebra. So um, in particular, simplices that lie in this set correspond to a subset of the simplices that define weighted projective spaces. And here, what's a weighted projective space? Well, this vector 1q is giving you exactly the weights of the projective coordinates of the associated weight of projective space, which is essentially just a, a toric variety. Okay. So um, these simplices have a nice relationship to algebra. And furthermore, it's really straightforward to compute their volume. All you have to do is add together the total sum of weights. You add up every um, integer that was in the Q vector, 
add one more to that, and that gives you exactly the volume of the policy. Okay. So I claim that we've already seen an example of this. So I was careful with the example I chose at the beginning to ensure that it was a uh, weighted projective space simplex. Here we can see that's the case because this was the convex hull of the two standard basis vectors. And this vector, um, you know, the negative of Q, uh, this point, negative two, negative three. Okay, and I also claim that this is reflexive and IDP. The reflexivity is um, straightforward to see from this complete characterization from Conrad's that says that a way to project a space simplex is reflexive if and only if each of the entries in your Q vector divide the total sum of weights. Okay, so here, if we add together two and three plus one more, that gives us six. And of course, these individual entries two and three here are both going to divide six. Okay, so we have reflexivity. And um, where does the IDP part come from? Okay, well, our focus uh, on the remainder of the talk is going to be on the subset of the delta one Qs that are so-called two supported, which just means that Q consists of two different distinct entries. Okay, and um, my advisor and two of his former students actually came up with a complete characterization of all of the two supported weighted projective space simplices that are both simultaneously IDP and reflexive. So if we're two supported, their Q vector can be written in this form where these X sub I's are just denoting the multiplicities of the distinct entries. And there's only two possibilities. Either the first distinct entry is a one, the second distinct entry is a one plus X one. And then, um, you know, of course, X one is going to be the multiplicity on the one and X two can be whatever it wants. Um, or if R1 is greater than one, in other words, our first distinct entry is greater than one, the second distinct entry must be one plus the first distinct entry times its multiplicity. And that's also going to force the, uh, the multiplicity of that second distinct entry as well. So for the remainder of the talk, we'll just assume that our Q vector satisfies the second form because verifying the, uh, the existence of the unimodular triangulation of the first form is actually straightforward if you appeal to these so-called affine free sum decompositions. Uh, but you know, from now on, we'll just assume that we're in this form too. So we're guaranteed that our simplices are IDP and reflexive, and we wanna figure out when do these things have a regular unimodular triangulation. Okay, so just to kind of motivate, why is it that we care about this? Well, there's a result, um, like a, a well-known result that says if a lattice polytope admits a unimodular triangulation, then it has to be IDP. And furthermore, Braun Davis and Solis said that if we have a two supported uh, delta one Q and it's IDP and reflexive, then it's um, corresponding Earhart H star vector is going to be unimodal. So I don't wanna dial uh, too much into Earhart theory, but essentially this H vector is just corresponding to coefficients on the corresponding Earhart polynomial, which is a polynomial you associate to a lattice polytope um, that encodes certain combinatorial properties of it. Okay, and we're interested in when it's going to be unimodal, which says that the coefficients weakly increase to a point and then weakly decrease after that. And furthermore, there was a result of Runs and Romer that said if we have a um, reflexive polytope that admits a regular unimodular triangulation, then it's going to have a unimodal H star vector. So it's of interest for us to figure out um, sort of in the converse of the first theorem, if we have reflexive IDP lattice polytopes, when are those going to admit um, regular unimodular triangulations? Okay, so now we can finally get to the main results of what it was that our project had discovered. Um, our sort of procedure here uh, to establish the triangulation was to begin by identifying a complete characterization of what the lattice points in these delta one Qs are. And from there, we, you know, give a triangulation based on a lexicographic ordering of the points, and then just ensure that it satisfies the regularity and unimodularity. So here, this script A is corresponding to a set of R1 plus three plus D points. So any two supported delta one Q will have exactly that many lattice points. And these um, tell you exactly what those lattice points are. So I claim that if we have an, uh, you know, the reflexive IDP delta one Q that's two supported, this script A um, set is going to give you the complete characterization for those points. And the order in which we put those is going to be the order that we place uh, whenever we do our triangulation. And so, for example, with our two, three from earlier, this is uh, what the lattice points would look like in that order. And how did we get our result? Well, we sort of appealed to this connection to algebra, which says um, that there, so 
for any polytope, you can talk about an associated um, polynomial ring where for each of the points in that point configuration, so in our case, it was that script A set, you associate some, um, you know, some variable in a polynomial ring, you set a lexicographic ordering on those variables, and then you can look at the kernel of a um, surjective ring homomorphism, which exactly defines the so-called initial ideal to the toric ideal. That toric ideal is the kernel to that, um, to that ring homomorphism. So if you can prove the existence of a lexicographic square-free initial ideal, then uh, there's a result of Sturmfels that gives you the existence of a regular unimodular triangulation for free. So that's how um, we get the second result. Um, we get the, the existence of the unimodular triangulation for free, so long as we prove this. And the idea of the proof of this was we had found, we constructed a Grobner basis for the associated polynomial ring um, proved that that Grobner basis was square free. Um, and then we get the corollary for free. But the proof of this was like 11 uh, pages of tedious case analysis. Um, and that concludes uh, everything that I had to say. So uh, if you're interested, here's a link to the preprint. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Derek. If everyone could either like clap or react clap and thank our speaker, that'd be great. Are there any questions from the audience? So I do have a question. Um, mm -hmm. so you told us this sort of very interesting story uh, for these polytopes constructed on a square lattice. Is it interesting to ask about doing similar constructions on other lattices? Um, yes, and I, so I, haven't personally done stuff like that because it gets more into the algebraic combinatoric side of things and not so much the geometric, which is what I focus on. But you can also like you can you can define interesting polytopes based on other lattices and talk about like the associated algebraic objects instead of um, you know the nice geometric objects that we're working with here. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also had a question. So you talked about this result for uh, partitions that have two parts. Is the story yes. very much more complicated for three parts? So like three supported? Yes. Projected so I, I just gave a talk a few days ago on, um, we recently put out a, a paper on the archive in the three supported case in which we give another like complete characterization for when, um, when the three supported delta one Qs will be IDP and reflexive. And earlier in the two supported case, we saw that there were only two conditions and it was very easy to define. In the three supported case, as Matthias is here, he saw the talk, he'll tell you how gross it looks. Um, there are eight different forms that, uh, but the, the divisibility criteria are significantly grosser because now we have an additional distinct entry with a different um, multiplicity corresponding to it as well, all of which factor in. So the derivations of those forms isn't too bad, but then verifying that the corresponding simplices are actually going to be IDP. Um, they have a nice characterization of that that simply relies on, um, on elementary number theory. So I just did like a bunch of computations of floor function stuff to verify the IDP-ness. I didn't have to use the original definition, but the proof of it was like over 20 pages. It's very... Uh, not so nice. So uh, Liam Solis, who was one of my collaborators on that other project, he's trying to convince me to do a triangulation thing in the three supported case, similar to what we did here. But I don't know if I want to do that because even just characterizing the lattice points seems like it's going to be rough. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. If not, thank you again, Derek, for the great talk and we can react one more time. Thank you.